Right, let us start. And before I do, let me just check you can hear my voice clearly. Um, fantastic. So this really is um, development of a very short lecture I gave at a fellow's dinner just a few weeks ago um, at the suggestion of a number of people. Um, and I was going to start just broadly saying why architecture. Um, I've got three quotes that seem to me to capture why this matters. Uh, Sir David Ajaye, who, as you may know, is a British Ghanaian architect, talks about buildings being deeply emotive structures which form our psyche. And I think if one is living and working in this space, it absolutely creates the idea of what it is to belong to the Wilson community. Uh, Le Corbusier, who of course is the master um, of most modern architecture, talks about architecture being forms assembled in the light. And I think that again, if one looks at Wolfson, one can see that this is not just about concrete, it's about the way light interacts with that concrete. Um, and my favourite one that some of you may know from Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, which is not terribly relevant to us, but it says a doctor can bury his mistakes, whereas an architect can only advise his clients to plant vines. <laughs> so if you are an architect, architecture stays with you. And if you make a mistake, you've made a mistake for a long time. The second thing I was going to say just to start with is that um, there are many people in the college who know a great deal more than I do about this subject. And some of the diagrams, some of the maps, some of the photographs have been contributed by other people. So uh, please, I'm certainly not claiming uh, enormous wisdom or knowledge. And there will be some of you here who can fill in the gaps that, we, uh, that I am not able to, to, to talk about. So where do we start? I think we start in the mud, because that's where we are, in the marsh and the mud. And here's Michael's fantastic quote, um, transforming a muddy field with a cow into a palace, which is fundamentally what the story of Wolfson has been. So here we are in 1605 in a map from the Library of Corpus Christi. Um, and I think this is the kink in the Charwell River, which is where we are. As you can see, there's marsh here, there's the common marsh, 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 marsh. It's essentially a very marshy area with lots of fields battling with the marsh. So that's where we are in 1605. Here we are into the early part of the 19th century. Um, and here is the kink that you will recognize. This is where we are right now. And I'd just like you to look at the main, the main highway into those fields coming along here, which is going to become, later on, Linton Road. Sorry, just going back, it says here, liable to flood. And as everyone who lives in this area knows, it is indeed liable to flood. And you will recognize this as the view over the bridge that many of us have seen over the years. So then we move forward to the early part of the 20th century. So we've had the great building boom in North Oxford from the 1850s onwards when St John's develop. And just to point out a few things, here we have Cherwell, the house which I'll talk about later. We're still liable to flooding and you see that this road has become Linton Road and it looks pretty recognisable from where we are now. There's a little boathouse there that's attached to this house called Churwell. There's a boathouse here, which is now the Churwell boathouse. Um, and here we have a bathing place with the school that is now the Dragon School here. So I, I haven't got any photographs of the bathing space. If anyone sees the bathing space school, it'd be lovely, lovely to have those. So this is where we are in the um, early part of the 20th century. And this is a view that some of you may remember, but you will certainly be able to imagine. This is the early 1960s. 
on Linton Road, and you can see here we have St Luke's Home for the Elderly, which is looking remarkably similar to what the annex looked like until about two or three months ago. We have a classic Rover P6, and this is the gateway into that space that will become Wolfson. So an extremely unprepossessing, unprepossessing entrance into this space. This, Geraint has um, identified this postcard, which we now have in the archives, so thanks very much, Liz, to this. So this is this house, Chowell, with the entrance... Um, uh, so this was built in the very early part of the 20th century, um, and it was built um, for the Haldane family, um, and this is very similar to the location that you see when you come into the college at the moment. There's some detective work around here. You know, which is that chestnut tree above us? And I think, and Geraint thinks, that it's the chestnut tree where all the bicycles are just outside here. So that is where we're viewing this house from. So who is this? Well, let's have a look. Here's another view of the house. And this is from the other side. So that is looking east. This is looking south. And if you could see here, you would see that there is a, um, there is a laboratory that was built here. And I'll read something to you about that later on. And here is the wonderful man who is the, the start of the story. So this is uh, J.S. Haldane. Um, Haldane, if Jacob had been here, I would have said Haldane, the name comes from half Dane because the Haldanes came in, in from the North Sea. Uh, his family started out in Glasgow, uh, and he was um, the member of a clan in Scotland called the Haldane clan. Um, and some of you may know that the motto of the Haldane clan is suffer. He, was, uh, he developed, really, the whole area of um, the physiology of the lungs and breathing. So, for example, the tables that are used to decide whether how to stop getting bends when you go come up from deep area was done by him. Um, he became Britain's leading expert in illness from or problems relating to breathing in gas during the First World War. Um, he was never a professor at Oxford, and one of the reasons that he built his own lab was because he didn't have access to the labs at Oxford. He was probably the opposite of health and safety um, nowadays. He was very free with his experiments on himself and on his son, JBS Haldane. And let me just read you a little quote um, relating to the, um, the house that we've just seen, Charwell. So as soon as that house was built, its extension began reaching into the garden, though leaving a south-facing wall perfect for apricots, was the new laboratory. Its windows looked out onto roses and peonies, while inside were sinks, a gas cupboard, working tables, and two steel chambers in which investigators could be sealed away for respiratory experiments. I think that may be one of them. These private gas chambers allowed just enough room for modest exercise, and small windows let observers peer in at the levels of distress displayed inside. So the, we have another fantastic bit of testimony from the grandson of J.S. Haldane. J.S. Haldane was known to his family as Uffa, meaning grand, grandpa. So he talks about the laboratory again. The laboratory was entered through Uffa's study. This was always thickly covered with papers on his desk and the floor, leaving only a narrow path on which to walk. And it contained interesting memorabilia from his diving work, including a brass diving helmet and a formidable diver's knife. One of his particular delights was to talk about the philosophy of science with distinguished colleagues. And in this way, I almost ran down Einstein, Albert Einstein, on my little bicycle when he was here at Charwell discussing relativity. 
We also had a wonderful playground in the attic at the top of the house where we made violent fireworks and bombs. A mixture of potassium chlorate that we stole from the lab and sugar would go up in flames if a little concentrated sulfuric acid was poured onto it. These bombs were all detonated in Haldane's Hole, a dump for toxic chemicals among the trees by the present bicycle shed. So again, just out here. So I think Chris Lysence, as our health and safety manager, would not have enjoyed operating at that time. The son, JBS Haldane, again, people will know, um, he uh, was a, a brilliant expert at evolution. Um, and in the 1930s, if you had asked British people who the greatest scientist of the day was, it would be him. He had a great communication style and had opinions on almost every aspect of science. Um, he was an, a, a very strong communist, a member of the Communist Party in the UK for many years. Um, and by the 1950s, he become completely disenchanted with Britain, its system, um, and therefore he moved to India to spend the last 15 years of his life living in India and became an Indian citizen. Um, so that is, that is him. So these are the Haldanes after whom the Haldane Lecture is named and after whom the Haldane Room in the college is named. So, so much for preparing the ground, as it were. Um, we then approach things from the Oxford University side. And as people will know, in the early 1960s, there was a dramatic increase in the numbers both of uh, lecturers and of students, including graduate students. But the growth was so great that the colleges didn't have the scope to increase their numbers to keep up. And so the university agreed uh, that it would establish a, a college, a new college, um, called Ifley College. Um, and we're jumping ahead a little bit, but that college um, would then be led by Isaiah Berlin, the great Isaiah Berlin, um, uh, who was appointed in 1966. And he agreed to do it, provided he could get significant amount of money to make it um, function. Um, and you will know that the two colleges that emerged from that process, one was Wolfson College with the money, and the other was St Cross College that didn't get the money. And their histories have been very different. And St Cross has never made it to be a college of the university because it never had enough funds to be that. So here you'll see that the Wolfson Foundation gave 1.5 million. I mean, you can imagine what a vast sum in those days it was. And the Ford Foundation gave 1.6 million in pounds. Uh, and you'll notice that we are not called the Ford College, we are called the Wolfson College, even though Ford gave more. And that, I think, is testament to the powers of Sir Isaac Wolfson, his persuasive powers, um, that it was named after him. Um, that 1.6 million pounds, if you had simply put it in a bank account and left it, would now be worth 38 million pounds. Um, luckily, we have been cleverer with it and it's now more, worth um, more than twice that. So um, we have looked after our money well. I don't know if anyone recognises this building. So this building, we're stepping back just a little bit, but this is called Court Place in Ifley. And had we not had the money and had Isaiah Berlin not become president, this is where Ifley College would have been. So this was the home of the late Egyptologist Sir Alan Gardner, um, famous for grammars of the hieroglyphs of um, Egypt. Um, and this is a house that, we, that the university still owns. Um, he died in 62 and gave it to the university for whatever it wanted to use it for. Um, and the wonderful church, St Mary's in Ifley, is just behind it. It's now graduate accommodation, I think. Um, but this was originally where the college was going to be based. And part of the original plan was that because it's down by the Ifley Lock, which is where the, the racing begins, um, it's a little bit distance from the centre of town. So the college was going to have a college boat which would take people from Wifley 
up to Folly Bridge and back again on a regular basis rather than our minibus. So I think that would have been pretty good and we should still make the case for a college boat to take us up and back to the Victoria Arms. But this is where we might have been, but we weren't. Uh, because the university here formally decided that it would give Cherwell the house to Wolfson College as its base. So this happened um, in October 1965, I think. Um, and so the, the fate, we, we, we became called Wolfson at that point, and then we had to go through the business of finding architects and then the building process itself. I wonder if anyone knows where this is. Um, it's the least, um, often seen as the least important part of the, this is the IT headquarters. Um, but this part of the IT headquarters, which is on Banbury Road, just opposite uh, engineering department, um, this, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is the very beginnings of um, Wolfson College. So this is where uh, Wolfson started, 15 Banbury Road. Um, and when it started in 1966, 66 to 68, we had 36 fellows um, in six rooms. Um, and this was where they sat and planned the future. They then moved up to 60 Banbury Road. Uh, this is now part of Kellogg College. Uh, and this is where Isaiah Berlin would sit in this office. And when people wanted to apply to be graduate students, this is where they would do the uh, interviews. Um, and on the other side of the road, in number 47, were the offices for the, uh, for the college. Um, so when the college moved here and found its punt harbour, the first three punts, instead of being numbered number one, number two, number three, were numbered number 11, number 60, and number 47 in memory of the first three buildings where the, uh, the college was based. This is a very complicated diagram, but this is what bursas of the bursa of the day would look at. And this gives you a sense of the property in which we had an interest back in, this must be about 67, 68, 69. Uh, so you see that Charwell, the house, is demolished that these buildings and these buildings we all have an interest in, that these are plots of land where we are going to purchase them. We have a 60-year lease on the Meads over the other side of the river. Um, and F is a bit of St John's property that we want to purchase. And this is what becomes the allotment. And so even now, we do have um, interest of various forms in most of these buildings, though obviously we own um, only a smaller number of them. So it was quite a complex um, piece of um, jigsaw to build the college from its original space. And this is where the um, architects come in. There's a long process to find the right architects, but eventually the college uh, identified um, Powell and Moyer, sometimes known as Pole and Moyer, um, who were a pair of brilliant young architects who in the post-war era in London, there had been enormous bombing taking place in London. Uh, so lots of rebuilding required. Anyone who was half decent as an architect had wonderful opportunities. Um, and they started to build um, social housing. Uh, and so this is their first famous building. It's the Churchill Gardens just opposite the Battersea Power Station, for those who know, um, who know London. Um, it had, interestingly enough, a direct link into the Battersea Power Station for the heating, so it had a community heating arrangement. So it makes me think that our own decarbonisation and centralised um, heating here um, follows in their original footsteps. Um, but they were therefore regarded as very um, exciting new architects who by the mid 60s had really established their reputation as the future of architecture. And here they are, uh, these two gentlemen here. So this is Philip Powell, who as you can see 
is the archetypal British gentleman dressed smartly in a suit. And this is Moya, Jaco Moya, who's a Californian originally from Mexico or his family from Mexico. And you can see that together they were both highly, a highly creative type, one might, one might say, but also a person who made sure that everyone trusted the architectural firm. And so the two of them were awarded the design and the building of the first of Wolfson. Where did they go for inspiration? They, of course, um, as any architect, a modern architect would, they went to Le Corbusier. Um, and this is um, a, a great example of Le Corbusier in any case. Um, this is a, a nunnery um, just northwest of uh, uh, Lyon in France. Um, but I think it captures very well the spirit both of monasticism, which originally Oxford colleges have always been um, inspired by, uh, but also the combination of highly modern concrete-based architecture with a rural setting. Uh, and I think this is the kind of piece that they went to as soon as they were given the, the, the question, how do you build something that's appropriate for a non-traditional college? So uh, Jaco Moya would travel up every day in his train from Surrey up into Waterloo and sketch as he went. And this was his original sketch for um, Wolfson. Uh, and you will see that it is A, set in this bucolic setting. It's right in the middle of nature. Um, but it's very straight lines and highly modernistic, but very low sitting in the, sitting in the, in the setting. Um, and you'll want to remember that that is a, a straight line at the moment in his conception. Of course, as we all know, turning a beautiful picture into a beautiful building, you need to go through a fair amount of uh, disruption. Uh, so here is the kind of disruption that was being faced. Uh, this is Harbour Quad. So you can see that the harbour is being built here and they're trying to, they're digging down, but they still haven't quite got the slope that it ends up being. Um, and this is probably taken from where the lower common room is at the moment. It's that kind of angle. Uh, it was absolutely essential that they keep the bucolic setting um, and therefore uh, trees were not cut down as they would now be cut down but they were built around um, and so here is tree quad um, uh, if you asked an architect now to be build around trees they'd say you wouldn't be allowed to do that the trees are far too close to the building um, but here the trees are in the building in in, in tree quad uh, this is the dining hall um, and okay now we come on to the story of uh, of the b block um, some of you will will know this story but it's worth recounting um, you'll have, remember that jaco moya wanted to build straight lines and isaiah berlin and all the fellows were very excited by most of his designs uh, but they didn't want everything to be absolutely straight all the time and so Isaiah Berlin lobbied um, Philip Powell intensively again and again from his holiday home in Portofino, um, just near Genoa on, on the um, Italian coast. And here is one of the postcards he sent, and he simply on the back of it wrote, let me persuade you to some gentle inclination to a shape less stiff. And what he's talking about is, of course, inspired by this, instead of having two straight lines coming out, you could have straight lines, but then one just curving its way around. And of course, when we reach the final building, you'll see that this wall eventually curves around. And that's why it's known as the Berlin Wall, because uh, Philip Powell renamed it the Berlin Wall. It's now known as uh, B-Block. So here is what it looked like as soon as it was built. Um, and as you can see, straight, low lines, um, absolutely integrated into the environment. One thing to say is it's sitting in North Oxford. We all know that to get here, you have to come through North Oxford. But architecturally, 
it's talking to the landscape and it turns its back on North Oxford. Um, so the entrance here is a pretty unimpressive location. There wasn't very much there to it. Um, this is where all the utilities come in. So if you live in North Oxford, it's not terribly impressive. In some ways, that's good. It's, it's unassuming. Um, every standard college has a gate and a tower. We certainly have no gates, and we've never had any gates, and we have no tower at the start. So let's look a little bit at the architecture as it was originally conceived. Well, here is the highest point of the college, where you've got one, two, three, four, five storeys. But as you arrive in the college, you're on two storeys. So there's a natural slope, and the college architecture follows that slope down. And if you look in from Linton Road, you would never believe that there was a five-storey building at the back of it, because the five storeys are going down rather than going up. There is a sort of a monolithic quality because it's in that uh, genre. It is um, that kind of that kind of building. But what distinguishes it is the attention to detail and the fact that as you look at it, actually, though on one area patterns repeat themselves, actually in other places it's a very different set of patterns. So architects will come and look at this place and say, this is a very, very interesting building where great care has been taken. This, uh, on the balconies, you will see that this glass is angled. Um, and that is for a very simple reason, that they wanted you to look at the glass and not see through it, but in all, you would then see the sky reflected on it. And so later on, I'll show you some pictures that show you why you get this fantastic blue on all of the balconies because of the angle, the careful angle of the, of the balcony glass. The other thing that's very striking about the building is that there are almost no rooms looking north. Almost all the rooms look south and there's very little, it's very hard to distinguish what is inside and what is outside. I mean, once you've gone into your door, through the door into your room, you're inside. But the corridor to your door, which would normally, in student accommodation, say, be a long corridor, is outside. And here you have these slatted glass that allows the air through, so that you do get the sense of, um, of air coming through, and you are both inside and outside, and the gap is not very obvious. And obviously, in an Oxford setting, where the predominant sense in a college is either you're in the college or you're out of the college. It's all about walls and in or out. This is a very deliberate statement that we're a different college. Inside and outside don't matter. We're much more open to the outside world. Here is the, uh, the Berlin Quad. Uh, and again, the, the mandate given to Paul and Moyer from uh, the fellows and from Isaiah Berlin was to be non-traditional but to be recognisably an Oxford college. And so we are structured around quads. We have a dining hall. We have cloisters. So the language of classical Oxford colleges is being deployed. And in the 60s, there were a number of other colleges in Oxford and Cambridge that were being built, which went beyond the language of colleges and created communities that didn't have these standard features. And when you visit them now, they're interesting. I mean, in Cambridge, a couple in Cambridge particularly. But there's no, you don't feel there's a heart to them. You walk through them, but they don't have a sense of being a college in the same way that this does. Um, and yet you'll find in a classic college, you enter your first quad right in the centre of a wall and it all opens up openly to you in a balanced way. Whereas here you enter and you're entering in one corner rather than if you go into Christchurch, for example, you come in through the great entrance and it all opens up in a symmetrical way. Uh, so there's a sort of a lack of symmetry to it, which is very central to the sense of being quirky and different. Um, it is, of course, the only college that has a hall that is square um, for obvious reasons that it wanted to get rid of the idea of having any end which is more senior or superior to the other end.
And there are things about this architecture which you will recognize if you're in around Ox uh, Wolfson immediately. So we've got these very thin uh, pillars that come up again and again and again. And sitting here, we see them repeated. Um, and also this very heavy um, granite encased in concrete, um, which is balances the sort of the solidity and monolithic nature of that balances the delicacy of the um, of the pillars. And there you can see quite how heavy and thick and dense this is. This is just a, a shot I took um, a few weeks ago, and that gives you this. You can see exactly how that inclination of the wind of, of the balcony reflects the sunshine, reflects the sky, and creates this amazing blue look. Um, and again, how the glasswork interacts with the sky. It sort of goes back again to Le Corbusier. It's as much about the light as it is about the uh, the concrete. Um, so this was funded by the by the uh, the. the um, Wolfson Foundation, uh, Sir Isaac Wolfson, um, a Glaswegian um, who became one of the richest men in the UK through un great u universal stores, uh, which eventually turned into Argos, I think. It's a, a mail order for, for um, company. And at some stage in the 50s and 60s, it was the biggest um, network of stores around the whole of Europe. So he was the one who, as a, uh, as a very um, practicing uh, Jew, was close to Isaiah Berlin and was very happy to give the 1.5 million. But he also wanted, therefore, to be connected with the building in ways that the early fellows and architects didn't necessarily appreciate. Um, and the classic example of this is the Marble Hall. Um, he hated concrete, which is odd, giving 1.5 million for the construction of a building that's fundamentally concrete. Um, but uh, he went into the marble hall which at the stage had been finished but was all concrete and he said that's impossible you can't do that it has to look grand I will get some Carrara marble um, to make it smarter so, so here here he is and here's the Carrara marble that he that he got the trouble is the proportions had already been built so he was putting beautiful Carrara marble on top of a space that was already beautifully proportioned. So many of you will know this particular corner and you may always have wondered why it seems to go sort of up like this and then down again. And that's because it was Carrara put on top of the original structure that Powell and Moyer had built. As you go up this, this particular space, you may remember just about here, you bang your head on a corner. Now you wouldn't have banged your head if you hadn't had the, the, the marble put on top of it. So the marble raised it to an extent that you bang your head on that corner. Um, again, as you come up from the quad, you may, again, remember these stairs that go up. And you may have thought, that's a little bit odd, the way those stairs come in like that, the marble comes in. And again, this is because there are stairs underneath that, beautifully designed, but he insisted you had to put marble on top of them. And the only way of doing that, oops, sorry, was to make this odd spacing here that if you look at it, it's not very satisfactory in aesthetic terms. So here is the topping out of the college. Um, and rather like the Life um, and Mind Centre in uh, central Oxford, where this happened two days ago, you have people who look rather uneasy wearing these hard hats with hard hats. So you have Isaiah Berlin topping out the, um, the, the building. Uh, so the building had been built from something like 69 through till 72. And after this point, it was built from 72. The interiors were done between 72 and early 74. And this is therefore what it looked like when it was completed in 74. Um, so some things to notice for the specialists. Um, you will see, oh yeah, this, this is my house. And you'll see that what is now a very small newt pond used to be a swimming pool. Uh, you will see that all of this space that is now the developments, the Robin Gandhi building, etc., were allotments. And this is the squash court um, standing in lonely splendor. These allotments, according to Walter, the, um, the gardener, 
who arrived uh, soon after this were the worst bits of uh, land in the whole area because that is where all of the building works had been based when the building was being done. So the soil was completely compressed and nothing would grow on it. You can also see this space here, which is wide open um, field. Now it's a forest. Uh, and so this is a space that was deliberately allowed to go wild, particularly by one of our early fellows who had an interest in a particular um, plant which grew in woodland. And he insisted in governing body that we shouldn't touch it. And so it's now a forest. But you can see also this house, which is no longer with us. This is what it looked like um, in 1976 to a, a, um, an, an idealistic David Gentleman, who's a great painter of, of Oxford and other great cities. Um, and again, you can see the effect of the light in that C block. And I always like the, the flares on the gentleman um, who is punting. Actually, one of the things that's worth looking at here is look at this end of the bridge. When you go over the bridge now, it's completely surrounded by trees, whereas at that stage there were no trees. So you walked out into the open um, meadow without any inhibition at that point. So then we start um, expanding because in those days we were around 300 graduate students, so quite a small number of graduate students. This year we are about 788, so there's quite a lot of catching up to do. So this is the Robin Gandhi building that people will know, tucked in just by what was the very lonely squash court. Architecturally, people will say that this is a building that is the least consistent with the original Powell and Moyer architecture. So it doesn't have the same roof structure, it doesn't have the same window structure, it doesn't have balconies. The way both sides of these are buildings have, have rooms. Uh, it does have the famous uh, pillars and it does have on the side the thick um, lumps of granite. Um, but this was the first place that added to our uh, places that we could um, accommodate students. Uh, we then move on to M Block, which is on the other side of the, um, of the squash court. And this is a much more in the spirit of Powell and Moyer building. Um, and then we go to Francis, um, the, the building named after Catherine Marriott, um, the, uh, the wife of Francis Marriott, who was um, also of our Marriott scholarships. Um, he was a statistician. Um, who was clearly extremely good with figures and with money, uh, which meant when he died, he, um, he was able to give us this building as well as the scholarships. Um, interestingly, it, when his, his wife died, he built it. He didn't want it named after her until he himself had died. So there was a period of about four or five years when it was called Q Building, um, and then it stopped being Q Building and it became Catherine Marriott. For those of you who are really interested in architecture, um, you may want to just have a look at that little space there because this is not a straight building. It's a building that goes, bends outwards at that end. And that is an architectural reference to the Berlin Wall, the original um, bending B block. It's not quite as impressive as the bending B block, uh, but it does have that opening happening there. Um, one of the problems with the early architecture was that the flat rule roofs didn't really work terribly well. We got into all sorts of legal problems. And so this is the first of our buildings that had a V shape in the top of the roof. So you didn't have flat roof problems. So we now come to a number of photographs that show you what it was like when you first arrived at the college. Um, and this, I think, Phil upstairs, in the AV, this is, I think, Phil, this is one of your photographs. Um, so this is looking from um, the entrance of the college at the time. Um, this is Linton Road. This is the beautiful annex. Um, and this people may remember as the cycle shed, the circular cycle shed. Um, 
people say that you were meant to put cycles in there, but actually people just dropped the cycles by the front door anyway. Um, but the, this was the slightly unprepossessing arrival at the college. This is, again, seeing it from the other side on a slightly better day. So there's the cycle shed. This is what's now the buttery. Uh, and this is the old entrance. Here is where you used to just have lots and lots of bicycles dropped everywhere. That's where Phil used to work from in the IT team. And I think, Richard, that used to be the flat for the bursa up there um, when bursas had their flats in the college. And you can see, just going back to the original Churwell, that this is, again, what it looked like from exactly the same angle. And this is, of course, what it looks like since the latest edition of this building we're standing in now. So the, the building of this space, this moves into areas where people will be much more current. Um, some people will have lived through this building. Um, so this building was started um, in 2012, the auditorium we're now in. And you may have seen these sketches that were taken through the course of building. So this is the early stage of the building. This is an interesting um, view of it from the very top of the tower down into the building being made. Um, here again, it is looking at our famous chestnut tree from the side, and this is where the entrance now is. You recognise where you are sitting, uh, and this is what it looked like um, when, it, when it opened. And of course, for those of you who don't know, you'll notice that it's not yet connected to the rest of the building. So there's a gap here that is waiting for money to be found to connect it to the building. So here we are. Um, and there are some little things that are worth noting when the building's connected. So you may notice that people had to decide in the cafe what to put on this little, um, little space here, how to, how to put it on. And what they decided to do as a, as a joke and a note to the original um, uh, marble hall was a little bit more of that Carrera marble was stuck on here, just to remind you of how awful the marble was in the marble hall. Um, all of the old uh, tropes are there, um, but there was a lot of care taken to make sure that um, the gap between the original building and the new extension remained often a little bit of a gap. So if you go up these stairs, and this is the first lift you come to, and you go up the stairs, there is a deliberate gap kept between the old exterior of the original building and the new extension here which the planners liked a great deal. Uh, here is, uh, again, looking into the cafe, you'll see that the complexity of, of style. Uh, and again, the pillars just upstairs above the cafe. This was the time when we started putting in solar panels. So here are the solar panels we put in, and we started putting green roofs into the college as well. Uh, then, just as I arrived, uh, you may remember that we updated the buttery when Powell and Moyer came back to look at their building, having just um, had it completed. They always would come back and they'd always see something that they thought, that didn't quite work as we intended. And the thing they found was that this arrival, that big wall of granite, was just a bit too monolithic. And they said, if only we'd inserted a little bit of glass there that would have allowed us to see in through into tree quad. It would have just lightened the whole thing up. So that's what the college did in 2018-19, uh, that kind of period. So you can see now we can look into tree quad through that gap. I won't dwell on the decarbonisation programme since most of it is simply underneath you and around you, but here are the massive cooling tanks that chuck out a lot of cold air because we're heating the college. And of course, all of the uh, new architecture, new, the new um, facilities for electric cars. So this is now what we, what we look like. This is the Wolfson um, that you will recognize as the place today. So let me end with just a little look towards the future where we might be heading over the next few years. Uh, well, the governing body decided to ask a team of architects called Panoya and Prasad, who have close connections with Powell and Moyer themselves, 
um, to tell us how they, if they had to create 150 extra rooms for students, how they would use the space we have. And after a lot of time of consultation, this is the, the plan or the design they came up to, uh, came up with. It certainly doesn't mean we'll do all of this, but it gives a sense of how you would find 150 extra spaces. Um, and we've moved particularly on, or we're moving on two particular ideas in this for the moment. So this is the South Car Park. Um, it looks um, extremely uh, well used, unpleasant. These, this is the base for all the decarbonisation work as well as um, around the college at the moment, which we hope will be cleared up reasonably soon. Um, and you will see here that in the original Powell and Moyer plans, they had hoped, this is the hall, they had hoped to extend with another wing, but they ran out of funds, it was not possible to do. And so the car park that was built here was effectively going to be the foundations for the next wing when, when it could be built. It's taken a while to develop the plans, but we now have architectural plans worked out with um, students and fellows who've been part of the process. Um, and so this is broadly where we will connect it. And this is an impression of what it will look like. So as you can see, extremely sympathetic to the design of the original, the same height, the same sense of um, uprights and horizontals. Um, the, the garden is not representative. It will sit absolutely in the current garden. We'll be putting some more investment into the garden around it. Um, and instead of concrete and granite, we'll, have, um, we'll be using this napped flint, which is a much more sustainable um, material. Um, we will be making sure that it is as highly sustainable and carbon neutral as it possibly can be. Um, and this is what um, a room on the ground floor would, would look like. Um, and again, thinking of light, because light is so central to Corbusier, to Powell and Moyer, we're going to make sure that there are lots of ways in which light comes down from through the top and creating spaces like these common spaces where light will come in. So it never feels like one of those airport hotels. And the other place we've been looking at um, is that lonely, uh, uh, that lonely uh, squash court. Um, or swash courts during the pandemic, one of the things that became very, very clear to us was that our gym, though it's wonderful to have a gym, was a little bit small for the number of people who wanted to use it. And particularly if you could only have one person in there at once, it really was a constraint. And that for our own well-being, good mental health, having a really good facility for um, sports and for, 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 um, for fitness was really important. We wanted both to have the dining hall for eating and coming together. We wanted this place for learning, and we would love to have a third high spot for the college, which would be the wellbeing centre. So this particular space is going to be extended um, into this um, larger space, two or three times bigger in practice. And this is what it's going to look like. Again, the, the style is very, very consistent with the Powell and Moyer. It uses the same kind of material we'll be using in the garden building. Um, it will be using the uh, cloisters um, to allow people to go to and fro. Uh, the entrance here to the playing fields will become really important. So this will be the route into the playing fields. Um, we'll have changing rooms here. Um, and broadly, we, we keep the squash courts. Uh, we have a big open space here full of general gym equipment for people who want to train. This room up here is the erg room for our rowing teams who are going to continue to go from strength to strength. Um, and there'll be a room here as well that can be used for you know, family groups, for yoga groups. So if one looks, this is, this is our, our head of the river men's and women's training team, um, erg room. Uh, and this is a sense of the interior down below. Um, if you're interested, um, we have about half the money for this wellbeing centre, but we're looking for another two million or so. So if you are interested, we'd be delighted if you want to help us. Um, for the um, garden building, 
uh, we will need to go to the markets to get funds for that, but we will also need to top it up with support from donors. So we will be going out and talking to people about that as well. So I hope that gives you a flavour of the college. Um, it has kept on growing. I think it's kept on getting better and better, bigger and bigger. We've been very careful to make sure the numbers of our students don't outgrow our capacity to give them the same experience. That's been a central consideration for us. Um, but I hope that both the culture of the original Wolfson as expressed in its architecture, the psyche of that original Wolfson continues through to the psyche of the present Wolfson. So thank you very much indeed, uh, and I'd be delighted to hear any questions. Thank you.